Building a matching pair of whips of any kind is an excellent way to test your consistency when it comes to whip making. In this video, we'll be constructing together this 7 foot, 16 plat matched pair of nylon whips. Throughout the video, I'll be showing you guys some different tricks and tips that I've been using throughout my whip making career, which have oftentimes enabled me to come up with some whips that were nearly indistinguishable from each other. So sit back, relax, grab some parachute cord, and enjoy the tutorial. So for this matched pair, I've already cut my two 10-inch steel handles. And from the beginning, from the handle, we want to make sure that these things are identical in length. Now, when we build this whip, we're going to do so by taking our first handle, preparing a core, and stopping, setting this aside, a place where we can reference to it frequently. Now, as we're building the core, we're going to be picking up that first core that we made, literally holding it next to our current um, core in progress. And the idea is to get everything the same length, the same dimensions, because when we're doing double-handed whip cracking, if that whip on the left is a little bit off in length and weight, it's going to overall affect the timing. Later on, if you are privileged to use a matched pair of whips that is even more precise in weight and balance than the ones that you learned on and adapted to, then it's kind of going to throw off your your ability to uh, be accurate and precise with two whips. Your body will adjust to those errors and then every perfect matched pair of whips will seem a little off. So it's important that if you're going to be building a matched pair for yourself or a friend or a customer um, that you do your best to get each whip as close as possible to each other. So with that being said, let's take our first handle and start with our core. I'm going to do that by unraveling some of this 3 8 inch sinker cord, which works great for the core. If you watch my other videos, I talk highly about this stuff. What we're going to do is just grab the other end and feed in our BBs. I'm only going to have on these whips a 6 inch portion of the core filled with BBs. Once again, we are considering um, the weight of the whips. Andreas is going to be using them in two-handed whip cracking routines. And if they're heavy, they're going to wear out the arms very quickly. So we don't want them to be so light that they are not cutting through the air and there's drag, but we want them to be somewhere in between so we're not wearing out our arms. So we're going to go just a little bit. That's it. That is all I'm going to fill this core with BBs. So we're going to stick this in the clamp. Tie that off with artificial sinew. So the BBs have a place to stop. Now when you're making a matched pair of whips, it's very important to consider that matched pairs are whips that take some of the most use out of all whips. Because it's constant routine, you're always cracking, you're always cracking the whips, oftentimes very, very quickly. So because of that, Matched pairs, if not built correctly, are notorious for wearing out very fast. Now we're going to fill this portion with BBs. It won't take much, maybe a little more. Probably going to have some extra in our brass rod here, brass tubing. So now we can slowly pull these out. Now a good method to pulling the, um, the, 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 the tube out is to just give it a little twist. We got some doubling up here. To eliminate the doubling up, you can turn this on its side and then 
the weight of all those BBs won't cause it to go in two rows like that. I'm going to try to include some new methods that I've kind of adapted to along this video. So if we turn this on its side like that and then pull it out, we won't nearly have as much doubling up going on. We have quite a bit of extra BBs here. So that's it. Very, very short BB loaded section on this core. About two inches of BB less core there. I'm going to trim the tip. Nice scissors, huh? Take one of our handles, feed this on like that, and butt it up against that first BB. Now I'm going to put this in the clamp. You take some electrical tape to fasten this down. going to hold it in place for us. Now we're going to spiral down and just cover up the BB portion. And this is just holding those BBs in a straight line, mostly while we work. This isn't adding any strength to the whip. And once we get down to here where the BBs stop, I'm just going to take a couple of wraps about two inches beyond. I'm going to cut this. Just like that. I'm going to grab some artificial sinew and bind over this area to add it. And this is going to give it its true true strength here. Artificial sinew is going to hold this in place. Binding very tightly here. And we'll go down an inch beyond the transition. And we'll go back up now. And once I rise up to the area here, once again I'm pulling really hard because this is a, uh, a very stressful part of the whip. This part is crucial for it to be tight. This is where all that pull is happening. Cut this, do a couple of half hitches. That. And that is looking good. I'm going to cut this. Excellent. Now I'm going to take this out. And I'm going to add some hockey tape along this bare metal. It's going to allow my first belly to be fixed in place and have something to grip so that it's not sliding on that smooth metal. Go at a very steep angle. That way you're using a minimal amount and wasting nothing. Just enough to cover that. That's all we want. Now if you look here, I haven't actually separated this core from the main spool yet. This is a method that I came up with, or I started doing, because I felt it was easier to get an accurate measurement without having to um, waste time, if you will. It works for me. Maybe it'll work for you. 
Now I'm going to do this. I'm going to, because I cut this 11 inches instead of 10, I have a little bit of room to work with with the knots that I'll be cutting off later on. So I'm going to measure an inch down. I'm going to start an inch down because I gave myself room for error. Now I'm going to measure out 6 feet instead of 7 because remember that last foot the core will consist of parachute cord instead of the artificial sinew. So we're going to measure six feet. Right there, we will cut that. So here is our first core. Now we can start the next core and have something to measure it by. Before we do that, I'm going to singe the uh, the end here so it doesn't fray. There we go. First core is complete. I'm going to lay it right next to our vise here so we can quickly measure, take measurements uh, from the original. Now I've marked here where the 3 8 inch sinker cord core slides over the steel handle and where it stops because we want to get even that measurement perfectly precise. Okay. So I'm going to grab my secondary handle. That's not it. There it is. Do the same thing we did last time. I didn't mark the transition because we can pretty easily tell where it is. Once again we're gonna slide this in. Now this is something that I like to do. When I take my second handle I like to slide it up even further. There's gonna be a little bit of waste here but it's easier to get exactly the same length. Looks good. Have our second stopper for our BBs. Slide this to the bottom. You can see we have a little longer core there, which will be trimmed off at the end. Put our handle back up here as a reference. Start pouring in some BBs. That's good. Once again, set this on its side so we don't get the doubling up of BBs from their own weight. I'm taking those measurements. I'm feeling with my fingertips where those BBs end. See that? I can feel it right there. And then I'm pulling this up to accommodate that. I can see where it ends here, but I can feel where it ends on the original. So we want the BBs as we hold this up together, we can point out exactly where that transition is. And where the transition is, obviously, that's where the BBs end on the original handle on the left here. So I'm holding them with my, my fingertips right here. I can feel it, that these are lined up. I can see the transitions here. See that? The transition is here. So I'm going to pinch with my thumbnail here. That is where we want the BBs to stop. And I can feel I have some extra BBs in there that are going to need to come out. So pinching it here, fingernails together, I'm going to dip this rod in, kind of scoop up those extra BBs that shouldn't be there. And then I'm going to tilt this upside down, still holding here. Little Chinese finger trap going on there, you see that? So scoop that right off like that. Dump these excess BBs back into our little holder. So I've got right here on my left hand, this is exactly the same amount of BBs that are in the original. So now I know where my transition is. I'm holding it up here. I'm holding up our secondary handle right here. And I have my white tape has marked the area that it needs to slide up to. So now that I have this area, I can let go and cut here. Now I can take my second handle 
And now this is going to stop me here. The BBs are going to stop me. So that's what I want. I can slide this in. And wherever the BBs stop me, we took measurements already. So we don't have to measure anymore on this particular part. Now when we hold them together, before we tape it, I'm confident that these measurements will be exact. Lining up the where our cores stop after they've been um, stretched over our handles. Going down, down, down. And if you look there, you can see that the BB stop at the exact same places. Now we can confidently tape this in place, reinforce it with some artificial sinew. Making a matched pair of whips is essentially a game of measuring. You're always taking measurements. And once again, we're going to start with our artificial sinew. We started here. And once I get past the transition here, reaching for my first whip. And I'm gonna be doing this a lot throughout this whole video, doing this thing where I just reached over and grabbed this. I wanna see where I stopped the artificial sinew, because that's important. Tops of the handles are even there. So I wanna stop here. A little indent with my fingernail. Stop there and back up to the top. And I'm gonna do a few half hitches, just pulling this in a loop around the back. Next step, hockey tape for grip. Let's see where we started that. Started it right here. And now we have to separate that core strand from the spool like we did in the beginning. Now we can match those handles up at the top there. And just slide our fingers down, put this cap on so I don't make a mess. And here is our six foot mark. We will cut it. See that? And singe it. There we have it. We have two identical cores. These are the strand lengths that we're going to be using for this matched pair of seven foot bull whips. Now this is actually a modified uh, recipe, if you will, for a six foot bull whip. And I've changed some of the strand lengths, made them a little bit longer on the second belly and on the overlay, of course. So doing this is going to give us uh, a little bit finer of a taper, or more gradual of a taper, that is. And the last two feet of the whip are going to be pretty consistently thin, and I want that handle to, to fall hitch ratio to be very big to very small. Doing this will also make these whips lighter, and it'll be more ideal for two-handed whip cracking routines. Now whenever I'm making a matched pair of whips, I like to just get the strand cutting over with to begin with. So as you can see, uh, this is an easy way to just keep track of things. I have belly one, belly one, belly two, belly two. So these, this is the first belly of the first whip, first belly of the second whip, and just so on. It just keeps things together, keeps things organized. And when you're working on two whips at the same time, it can become a mess if you're not careful about uh, keeping your strands organized. So this is just a little labeling method that works for me, might work for you too. So it's time to install the first belly of our first whip. We're going to do this like we do in any other video. Two strands, doesn't matter which ones, around the back. And the other two strands, I already have the middles marked on all of these strands, so I can just let go. And our other two strands, through the loop, Find those metals. One. Two. 
And now we're just going to plate the handle under two over two. Now I want to show you a new little method that I came up with or that I started doing. I know I keep saying I came up with, but what I mean is that I started using this method. I will go under two over two for the first few passes just to lock down that belly so it's not doing this. And this is a method that we can use to get the whip done quicker. I like to do this on all of my handles now. So I'm going to keep plating until I get an inch above the transition. Then I'll switch over to an under two over two single strand. Okay, we plated the handle and as you can see we're about an inch away from the transition. And now I'm going to transition back into a single strand under two over two because that's a stronger pattern. And we don't have to worry about as much tension on the handle because there really isn't a lot of tension on the handle. Tension uh, comes into play at the transition. So now an inch away from the transition, we are gonna go right into our single strand under two over two, just like this. Now because this first whip here um, is the example whip, and this is what we're going to be measuring our second whip by, we can just drop strands naturally as the time arises. In other words, I'm just plating this belly and just plating it as I go. I'm not worrying about exactly where I'm dropping strands because once we have this finished, when we go to do our next whip, then we'll have this thing to measure that one by and know when exactly to drop strands. So I'm just gonna plate this thing just like I would any other whip and drop strands as I go. So I'm gonna go ahead and plate, drop as I need and finish this belly and I'll come back. Just finished plating belly one of whip one. As you can see, I've left the dropped strands exposed here so that when we plate our next belly one of whip, whip two, whip number two, we can see and line them up side by side and we can determine exactly when and where to drop strands. Because we want the drop strands to be in the same place. All the way down to the end here, down to where the last strand is binded up against our core. Now before I bind the transition here, I'm actually going to start the first belly of the second whip. That way I can see exactly where I transition from this two strand uh, diamond pattern to my herringbone here. So I'm going to go ahead and grab my second core, put it in the clamp, and do the same thing I did to that one. Okay, I just finished plating the handle on whip number two. And it's time that we transition into the herringbone pattern. We're leaving the handle, getting ready to go over the transition. So I'm grabbing whip number one, and I'm comparing it side by side with whip number two that we're currently working on. Now, you can get crazy, I like to do this, and actually count the passes. There just so happens to be 16 passes of two strands. So I've reached my 16th pass right here, two strands together, and that's how I know, in addition to having them lined up perfectly, that's how I know that it's time to go into a under two, over two single strand herringbone pattern. So we're gonna keep plating over this, uh, over this transition here, and we're gonna keep going down till we find our first drop strand. Okay, it is time to drop some strands on whip number two. I'm going to take whip number one, the tops of the handles are even, and I'm looking down here, and I just need to see where those strands, approximately where those strands are dropped. And you don't have to count the number of passes you're making, it just has to be just one or two strand widths within that drop strand on the original. So we're just using this as a guide. Wherever the strands are dropped on whip one, that's where we're dropping them on whip number two. So this is prompting us to drop the strands. And I'm doing this all the way whenever, all the way down whenever I see that strands need to be dropped. I'm just comparing it. 
to the whip number one. Now this is a little method that may be laughable to some, and it is kind of funny when you think about it, but I've actually taped these two whips together. That way I have my example whip on the right, whip number one, and while I'm working on whip number two, I can just intermittently grab that already completed belly and just kind of hold it up so when I'm, when I'm plating down, I just go, well, I'm here. Is this where I need to drop the strand? I just simply grab the example whip and go, well, yeah, that's where I need to drop strands. So the first drop dropping of strands was successful. Now I'm coming up to the second place where we need to drop some strands. So I'm just using that whip. They're obviously still lined up there. And using that whip one as a reference. So this is the last time I'll talk about dropping strands for this particular belly. And I'll meet up with you at the end. All right, we've reached the end of the first belly on whip number two. So let's grab whip number one down here and just see if this is where we should end everything. And it sure is. We can see here that this is where this belly is ended. I've stopped plating an under one over one and just carried these strands in its staggered form all the way down. So I'm going to tie these in place and do just what I did to whip number one. Carry that last strand all the way down to here, right there. And then we'll get into the binding. So we've got a pair of pretty identical first bellies for these two whips. You can see the strand drops are at the same spots. The ended bellies are at the same spot. So now it's time to bind both of these. Okay, now that we have both of these complete, it's time to snip off the excess strands, as we always do, and melt them into the belly of the whip. We're going to do this for both whips, and then we're going to begin uh, the binding starting just above the transition. Getting ready to bind these two whips, and you know me, I can't resist a beautiful day to work in the park. Got my clamp over here, mobile whip shop. So let's get with it. We're going to start with whip number one. We're going to be using the floor mat tape as our bolster material for both of these whips. Here's something I like to do just to gauge how wide of a piece I need. Pretty good. And I'm going to be cutting these pieces about six inches long here. And don't worry, I pick up all my scraps when I work at the park. A little bit of excess there. I'm going to trim that just a touch. That looks good. Now, a lot of people actually told me that they left this yellow backing on. You don't want to do that. That's just to keep both sides sticky. So this part you discard. Throw that away. You don't want that. This is the part you want. See that and how strong that is? So, you can see where it is. I'm going to go up an inch above the transition point. So we're overlapping about an inch over the metal. I'll grab my artificial sinew, and away we go. Now, some people like to just do a crisscross pattern to begin with. Um, I'm going to actually do use that method for this part as well. And I'm going to work my way down and then I'm going to work my way back up. Now once we work our way down on this double stick mesh tape here, you'll notice as the whip gets thinner, as it should, we have a little bit of excess overlap there. That's going to add a little bit of bulkiness we don't need. So I like to just trim it back a little bit to accommodate for the taper. Now as you can see, when we pull that around, they're meeting up just about end on end. As you can see there, I cut it a little bit short there. We finish the binding here. You can see we can just make out right where the floor mat double stick tape stopped right here, so I'm not going to mark that because I can still see the white poking through a little bit. I carried on the binding about three inches past that ending point on the floor mat tape. So I went all the way down. 
I went back up, I went just an inch beyond here, I went back up, back down, and back up. So I went down and back a total of three times. Also when I'm binding, I use the method of tapering my uh, tension. So I'm pulling much harder here than I am pulling down here. And I taper that rigidity as I go down, and that's what helps the whip to have that springiness to it. Keep in mind, this is only the first belly, and we got that pretty tight. I want this whip to be, uh, to have a little bit stronger of a transition than the average whip because, like I said, Andreas uh, is, is going to be using this, both of these whips, a lot for double handed whip cracking. And they take a lot of, of use, these whips, these types of whips. So we're ready to do this. Um, same thing to whip number two. Here's whip number one right alongside it for comparison. Now we don't have the luxury of being able to tape, uh, tape this to whip number one, so we're just gonna hold it up here. So I can have these ends lined up right here, and I can see that we started it right here. Remember we used six inches of our floor mat tape. First off, get my diameter or uh, excuse me, the width, width I guess, and diameter. Right there, mark that with my fingernail. That's where we're going to cut. Six inches of floor mat tape. Lining these up, so you can see about an inch up from the transition, and that is where we're going to bind this on. And we're just repeating what we did with the first whip. There's a quick little comparison of the two, checking our progress. Lined up here, also lined up here as well. So we can go ahead and finish binding this second whip. I had a, a woman come up to me once while I was making whips here and ask me if I was doing landscaping. I kind of smiled and said, no, <laughs> no, I'm not doing landscaping. I never heard of landscaping that looks like this. I just thought that was the funniest thing, most random thing ever. See this? We're going to go all the way here. This is where the binding ends. Okay, I just finished the last pass here. I'll make a quick comparison. Whips, handle ends are lined up. And we are good. And down here, go another quarter of an inch down. And ascending up to the top once again, and that will finish off the binding for whip number two. And both bellies will be complete with the exception of a hefty roll that I'm going to be giving both of these. As we reach the top, I'm wrapping tighter and tighter. So this part's thicker. And this is the center of all force and pressure that's exerted on a whip. I don't know how many times I've said that. Too many. And we're going to tie this off with a couple of half hitch knots. And there we are, two completed first bellies along with their bindings. So I'm going to bind the ends of the handles right here with the artificial sinew. That way when we have all those layers stacked up on top of each other, that binding is going to give those nails something to purchase. And uh, I'm just going to bind these real quick. Okay, I have some binding here on the tops of the handles. Okay, two completed first bellies along with the bindings for this matched pair of seven foot bull whips. All done. Now this next step, tying on the second bellies of both whips, is almost identical 
to tying on the first bellies of both whips. So I'm gonna be a little bit more sparing on how much I show here. The only difference really is that the binding process is gonna be a little bit more extensive because we want it to be a little tighter than belly one. Also, our double stick floor mat tape is going to be longer for these second bellies because we wanna carry out that rigidity a little bit further. Look at my tiny little car. Time to tie on the second belly, which is a 10 plat. Three random strands, don't care which ones these are. Around the back. Middles are marked, so I don't care where those middles are temporarily. One. Two. So same for this, I'm gonna start with single strand herringbone plating under three over two. And then I'm gonna transition into that two strand side by side. This is the greatest motorsport event in the world. Pushing that up to the top. Give these all one more pull. We have these tight, we can go into a two strand under three over two for the handle. That's just for the handle. And I'm just going to plate the entire handle like this and just like the first bellies, when I arrive at one inch before the transition, I will switch over to single strand herringbone of under three over two on both sides. Okay, we've reached the point where we can transition from our two strand under three over two to single strand herringbone under three over two. So we will do that right now. Make sure you're plating nice and tightly over the transition especially. And just like Belly number one of whip number one, we're just gonna plate and drop strands when the time comes. When the strands become too short to plate anymore, that's when we drop them. We're just gonna let the predetermined length of these strands prompt us when to drop strands, just naturally. So I'm gonna finish this belly number two of whip one, and we'll pick up there. All right, we're back in the whip shop out of the cold wind. Currently working on belly two of whip number two. And I have the handles even at the top and I've just switched over to a herringbone pattern on whip number two. So I'm gonna plate down just like I did for the first two bellies. And I'm going to drop strands when the dropped strands on the first whip cues me to do so, just like the first bellies. I'm not gonna show this process because it's literally identical um, to the first bellies. So I'll meet up with you as soon as I'm done plating this whip number two, and we will bind these bellies. Belly two binding has been completed here, as you can see. And I'm using, instead of a six inch piece of floor mat double stick uh, tape, I'm using a one foot piece here. And that'll carry out this transition a little bit longer because this is the second belly. So once again, I'm holding up whip number one in comparison, and the handles are even. As you can see, I've already started that new bolster right there. So just like we did before on the first bellies, I'm gonna do the same thing with these. The only difference is at the very end, we're gonna go over the transition a few times with this stuff. This is Dacron. Very, very, very strong material. So same thing, we're just doing that crisscrossing pattern. Making sure that these meet right in the middle like a zipper. And just like we did before, we're gonna carry this all the way down. I'm gonna go beyond the point where this ends. Here we are, carrying that binding beyond the tape. Adding the binding and the floor mat tape 
on the second bellies of these whips uh, is proportional, meaning that we're doing the same thing that we did for the first bellies, but we're just doing everything a little bit bigger. Notice I'm carrying this on about roughly twice the length that I carried it past on the first belly. And we line these up, we can see that this ends here, this ends here, we're looking good. Now we can ascend back up to the top. Now, something I didn't really explain a few minutes ago, when I'm binding and working my way towards the end of the whip, I'm doing this crisscross pattern like this, making an X, going down, making an X. But when I'm ascending to the top, all I'm doing is I'm filling in those spaces that you see. See what I mean? I'm going in between the gaps, like this. Every time I'm going up, going in between the gaps that. See that? There's a gap there. Going right in the middle. Right in the middle. Right in the middle. All the way up to the top. Once again, just like last time, we're going down, back up, down, a little bit shorter distance, back up, down, and then back up. So we're going down and back up at three times. Now to finish off the binding, I have here some Dacron tape. Stuff is kind of hard to find, but I've included in the description a few places where you can get this. And I usually use this stuff as um, a last little layer of binding, just to give that extra strength to a transition, especially to a matched pair of whips. And for this uh, also, I'm gonna be using crisscross pattern like this about a 45 degree angle this is just giving it a little extra strength actually a decent amount of strength The way I like to do this is before I cut this artificial sinew, I'll start wrapping with this. So when I get back up to the top, I can set this spool down. Neither of these have been cut yet. Now I take the artificial sinew and wrap this very tightly and that holds that in place for good. See that? This, press it into the binding and trim that. Now we have two nearly identical binded second bellies of both of these seven foot whips. Now it's time to take our overlay paracord and measure out our strands and begin plating the overlay of whip one. So we're gonna be doing these whips in chocolate brown, which is one of my favorite colors for nylon whips because it really resembles that traditional leather color. So I'm gonna measure out these strands. Please refer to the strand lengths that I gave you and we'll get to plating. Okay, so I've tied on the overlay strands of whip number one. And the whole handle is going to be a two strand 16 plat diamond pattern. So I'm gonna plate that the entire length of the handle and then here I will switch over to the 16 plat herringbone pattern which is under four over four. Okay, the handle is complete and we are now transitioning into our herringbone pattern which will be carried out to the end of the whip. Just like the previous bellies, um, because this is whip number one, uh, this will be our example whip. So as strands shorten to, when we, to where we can't plate them anymore, uh, we're going to let that prompt us on when to drop strands. The only difference with this is we're not dropping the strands in the same fashion. Because this is the overlay, we have to drop the strands and tuck them underneath. So I will be marking where I drop the strands uh, with some tape so that when we start plating the overlay of whip number two, I can see where those strands were dropped and I can drop them accordingly side by side um, so that we have identical uh, functioning whips. So I'm going to plate this, mark where my strand drops are all the way to the end, tie the fall hitch, and we will begin whip number two's overlay. 
just finished attaching the fall to whip number one. The overlay is complete. Now, as you can see here, as I plated down the whip, wherever I dropped strands, you can see in black electrical tape, I have marked that area. Now, because the strands are dropped in a staggered fashion, I'll drop one on the left, go down a little bit and drop another one on the right. Because I did that, I placed the tape in between where the two strands are dropped. Now the reason that I used white tape down here to indicate uh, strand drops is because these are different types of strand drops, meaning that when I dropped these strands, that strand became the core. And that goes along with my new method of making a nylon bullwhip. The 3 8 inch sinker cord doesn't go all the way to the end here. What, comp what uh, makes up the core here is actually composed of drop strands. So there's only two places that I drop a strand and that strand becomes a core and that's these two spots right here. So I've cut the strands over here for our overlay of whip number two. And I'm just getting ready to put it in the clamp and we'll begin plating the overlay of the second whip. Whip two is in the clamp and away we go. Two strand diamond plaid under two, over two, under two, over two on both sides. We're going to carry out this handle all the way to the end. Now for the overlay I'm actually going to count the number of passes and that will help us, uh, it'll indicate where we transition into the herringbone. So literally when I'm done with the handle I'm going to line them up and count the 45 degree angles. Okay so if we look to the left here we've finished the two strand 16 plaid diamond handle. Now what I'm going to do is hold these end to end here. And we're going to count on the example whip here on the right, whip number one, we're going to count those 45 degree angle um, two strand sections that are side by side. So the reason that we're counting these sections of the plating is so that we can compare it to the second whip. So I'm going to start with this big double slant right here that goes across two. So that's one two right underneath it, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, and twenty-two. So there's twenty-two forty-five degree angle uh, sections of strand. So there are twenty-two diamonds that we counted on whip number one. So if we look at our whip number two, I've already counted those two strands together, starting with this one right here. So I've counted all the way down. If we go here, we can see that this is the 22nd group. That means it's time to go into our herringbone pattern. Two strands point to the upper right, so we're going to go around the back. One strand. Now here's a little tip that's good to know. When you're plating, obviously we're going to be going under 4 over 4 because this is a 16 plat whip. Now pay attention here. Obviously it makes sense to go over 4 because this is not in our way. This is a, a, a strand that's on top. When we're alternating, uh, this one's on the surface, this one's on the bottom. So there's no problem there going over those four strands. But if we look on the right side, we will run into a bit of a, a little hiccup here, if you will, if, if we're not careful. Notice I, I want to go under, under four over four, but not yet. If we go under four over four, there's going to be a weird little thing happening. This is going to happen. So for one pass, we're actually going to go under five over three just for that one part. Alternating back under 4 over 4 on the left side. And now, if you look over here, surface strand is prompting us to do a left strand here. Now if we look at this, this is all evened out now. Under 4 over 4 will be natural and there won't be that bulge there. So that's a little trick that you can do to keep your plating even. And there we have it. I'm going to keep on plating here. And once whip number one prompts us to drop our first strands, we'll do so. 
Okay, plating right along. Everything's looking even. Our transitions are pretty much identical here. Moving down the whip, I'm being prompted now to, to drop the first strand here. So you can see this is where the strands begin to drop. I'm going to drop this strand. So there's the first strand being dropped, and then the other strand to be dropped is right over here. So working our way down, as you can see, I'm being prompted by whip number one to go ahead and drop another two strands. So we can see we're running out quick, so this will be a perfect place to do it. So two more strands are going to be dropped uh, right here. I'm watching some fishing videos. Perfect. Right on schedule. And here comes the drop. When the strands get this short, I like to take a pair of pliers. Yeah, don't do that. Give it one last pull. And now we're ready to drop it. I like dropping when there's two strands below too because it's double the pressure and it's going to be holding the strand down when we do this, when we swing it around and make it become one with the core, the belly below. Continue plating. Now we're back to under three over three on the right side temporarily. And on the left, Temporarily under four over three. Pretty soon it'll be a 12 plat under under three over three on both sides. And perfect. Well, there's another two strands that have been dropped. We're moving along, making pretty good time actually. I'm gonna go ahead and drop strands as I'm prompted by this tape uh, from whip number one all the way down until I get to these guys and this is a whole nother type of dropped strands. Now I should mention here not only is it important to make um, frequent references to whip number one when you're making a matched pair uh, as far as where you're dropping strands and if you're uh, doing so accordingly to the first whip but it's also important to pay attention to diameters uh, of your bellies uh, as well as the overlay. I'm not talking about getting a, uh, a caliper out and and measuring the, the diameter, no. I'm just talking about making quick references, just eyeballing it, making sure that the diameter isn't uh, bigger on one whip uh, than on the other. But of course, when you're doing so, make sure that the handles are even so you're getting an accurate uh, comparison between the two. Okay, we have been dropping strands along the way, and we're now done with every place that we have strands dropped in a traditional fashion for an overlay. We're reaching our first piece of white tape, and that indicates that we're dropping a strand, and that strand is becoming the core of the whip. I'm going to show you just how we'll do that. So this is indicating that we have reached that point. I'm going to let this guy go. Now two of these strands are going to be shorter uh, than the other strands. So I'm going to take those two shorter strands. We'll start with the first one right here. I'm just going to plate a couple passes here. So here's our shorter strand. Go around the back. And this will be its final resting place right there. So here's the shorter strand. I'm going to plate one more strand over that before we drop it. That'll kind of help hold it and lock it in place. So here is our strand to be dropped. There we are. I'm going to make a quick adjustment with the camera. There we go. So giving everything a nice pull here. Giving this one a nice pull. This is our strand we're dropping. Pull it. And then just pull it under like that and then continue plating. 
At this point, because this strand has become our core, I like to taper our 3 8 inch sinker cord. Just because we don't need it anymore, but we do want it to kind of fade out in a gradual way so that there's no uh, lump there. And we just keep on plating. Right on schedule. Making sure uh, that there's no gaps here. This this is a very common place to um, unintentionally have some gaps in your plating. And just, you know, be aware of that. Turn it over frequently. Make sure that you're really guiding those strands in. For example, this one around the back. As I'm coming around the back, I'm using my index finger to just kind of tuck it, see right right here, to just hold it up against there while I use my other fingers to pull it around. Now I can let go. So it's just kind of the, the anatomy of, of plating. There's a bunch of ways, a bunch of things that you can do to help lock those strands into place. So as you can see, this is currently the core of the whip, this dropped strand. So now we're going to take our other strand to be dropped, which is this one right here. Just like we did before. Here's our strand to be dropped right here. One last pull. Now this one will become the core. So that means our previous core will be cut at an angle. Make sure you're cutting the right strand when you do this. It's easy to not cut the correct strand. Okay. So this is our brand new strand we just dropped, and it's our core. We cut this because we don't want it to be double wide. Otherwise, it's going to be bulky, and our, our whip won't taper to our liking. So this is a four plat all the way to the end of the whip, under one over one. You can choose to singe that cut strand there if you choose to. That's fine. If you choose to do that, it'll help just kind of get the strand out of the way and fuse it to the core. And that's it. We are plating this thing all the way to the end. Strands are dropped successfully, and let's work our way to this fall hitch. All right, it is time to tie on a fall for whip number two here. Before we do that, even though it looks like everything is even, we're going to line the whips up end to end and go down and make sure everything is good. So let's start by making sure the ends are perfectly lined up. All the way down. As you can see, we've got a little ways to go. If I would have just went ahead and tied on that fall hitch without doing what I just did, we would end up with a whip that was about you know, one inch shorter than the other one. So at this point, I'm going to tape these together right here because we know for a fact that if we work our way back up from this point, the handles will be perfectly even. I'm going to take some electrical tape and temporarily tie these whips together. And make sure that they can't slide freely from each other. So now we are even. I'm going to go ahead and make another fall a little bit longer than this one so that way when we tie it on to whip number two 
I can just trim it to make it exactly the same length as this fall. Once again, I made this a little bit longer than this fall because that way when we attach it, I can trim the end and we can make them exactly the same length. It's just easier to do so than having to be precise when you thread the needle inside of the parachute cord. So just like we did before, everything goes through. You can cinch up that loop now. And let's just tie a standard fall hitch. This is how I know I've already used that strand. This is the core strand here. We'll tie a knot in there so we don't get it confused with the other strands. Looking good. And there's our last strand. And we look to be perfectly even once we slide the fall down. And lastly, I've threaded our final strand that we tied a half hitch with. We're going to feed that back through the rest of the loops, as well as the fall. And now I'm going to seat the fall in place. Now I'm not yanking this as hard as I can, I'm just getting it seated and I'm going to let the cracking of the whip do the rest of the work. So just nice and snug. Now I will one by one pull these strands and tighten them up. So this is the core strand. I've tied two knots in it so we don't unnecessarily pull on that one. There we go. Lined up pretty good here. I'm going to cut off the remaining strands, making sure that I, I get them the same length as they are on whip number one. Careful not to cut your fall off. Very misfortunate action. <laughs> Done it many times. Okay. Give this one last little pull here. Make sure that it's in place. And then I'm going to singe it. Get that heat away from my lens. So there we go. There is two completed fall hitches on our matched pair of seven foot nylon bull whips. The next step is to make sure the falls are the exact length. And sliding my fingers down, making sure that they cannot move freely from each other. All the way down. The fall on the left is from whip one. So we're going to snip fall two. A couple millimeters longer because when we singe this, it will shrink up on us a little bit. Now I'm going to seal that off by melting it. And there we have two falls of equal length. Okay, I just gave both of these whips a nice roll on the floor. 
Once more, I'm going to just check for consistency. I'm going to make sure that the whips are overall the same length, as well as make sure that the diameter of each whip doesn't deviate from one another. So like we've done throughout this entire project, I'm going to line up the handles, take note of where they start. Handles look good. Really feeling the diameter of both whips as it goes through my hand, making sure they're the same all the way down to the fall hitches. It's time to prepare our heel knots for both whips. I have whip number one in the clamp, and I'm going to bind the end here, so that way we can get a nice even starting point. Also, I'm going to add a layer of electrical tape so that when we cut, the artificial sinew will not unravel on us. So there's whip number one. You can feel that knot right here. This is whip number one that I have in the clamp. Three hundred sixty degrees around. I'm cutting all the way to the steel. few people said, wouldn't it be better if you singed the ends here and melted all this together to make it even after cutting the steel rod? And yes, I'll do it after as well. But I like to do this before I cut the steel rod because it helps me see what I'm doing. It also helps me make sure that I am cutting it evenly on the steel. So this one is ready for a knot foundation. But before we do that, since we're building both of these at the same time, I'm gonna use it as a comparison whip for whip number two. Whip number one on the left, whip number two on the right, using whip number one as a guide once again. So comparing the two, whip number one is telling me that I need to start the binding there I need to cut just above there. So now that we know where we need to carry out both of those tasks, I grab I'll, I'll grab here a spool of artificial sinew and begin binding. Nice and tight here, folks, because this is the area that the knot foundation is going to be tied over. And we want those foundation knot nails, the anchor nails, to have something to really pull against.
Grabbing whip, whip number one here just for a quick comparison again. There's a lot of juggling involved when it comes to making a matched pair of whips. Okay, looks good. Give this a layer of tape here. And we'll get to cutting. Quick comparison. Perfect. Time to tie on some knot foundations. Whip number one in the clamp. This is a 24 millimeter wide strip of 11 ounce cowhide that we're gonna be using for our heel knot foundations. We're also gonna be using uh, the method where we take a piece of paracord ungutted and spiral it, and that's going to be a spiral disc uh, end cap for this knot. So we're gonna start off by taking our strip of leather, and fitting it, marking it with my fingernail, and see where I need to cut it. See how that looks. Seems to fit well. I'm going to trim it just a little bit more. There we go. Artificial sinew in hand. Could just say sinew. Why do I always have to say artificial? I don't know. And let's tie this in place with our sinew. If you've made it to this point, guys, um, the finish line is well in sight. Once you get that second knot foundation on whip number two and it's even, I'm telling you guys, you're almost done. So hang in there. I know it's, this has been a long video. Been a lot of comparing between the two whips going on over and over and over again. One is ready for some nails. Number two in the clamp. I pre cut this, just make sure that it's also 24 millimeters. Perfect. The shorter your piece of leather is, let me just kick my camera over real quick. The shorter the leather piece is, the tighter that you have to wrap it to make those two ends meet. So you don't want it to be too loose, <clears throat> but you do want the fact that you're wrapping it tightly to be what causes those two ends to meet. Whip number two is ready for some nails. Anchor nails are important, especially on a whip such as this. All right, the anchor nails for our knot foundations are complete for both whips. Now it's time to add a spiral disc of paracord to each one. Man, who's got time for a hot glue gun to warm up? Not me. That is ready for a knot. Give or take a little bit of athletic tape that I may or may not put around here. 
we'll see. I even like to count the spirals, starting with this outer one here, going in, including this one. One, two, three, four, five. I know it's silly, but I really like to get these whips as close as possible to each other. Making a mess. Looks good. For the sake of giving our 6x7 Turks head knot a little bit more of something to grip to, I'm going to give this a few more loose wraps of sinew. This also is going to cover up those nail heads that didn't burrow themselves quite as deep as I had hoped. Also, the sinew is sticky because of the wax. And it's going to be a little more sticky, actually a lot more sticky, than our hockey tape would be. So, whip number one is ready for our knot. Whip number two is ready for a knot. There's one pass complete. Time to expand this 5x4 to a 6x7. Have a video on that. You can find it in, this, in the description. Okay, the first pass of this 6x7 Turk's Head Knot is complete. This is whip number one. I'm gonna finish this baby off. All right, coming up on the last pass of this 6x7 two-pass Turk's Head Knot for our heel of whip number one, and we are going to do the exact same knot on whip number two. Here's the final stretch right here. All right, we're gonna even things out a little bit, snip the excess, and this knot will be ready to roll. Here at the heels, let me give them a nice little roll. Got whip number one back in the clamp. And all I really do nowadays for a transition knot foundation is I build it up with a little bit of artificial sinew. There we are. Scissors are out of reach. And whip number Two, going to clamp. It's so crazy. We are comparing whip one to whip two for a reference all the way until we tie on the cracker for whip two. The entire video. Can't stress that enough. We're constantly making comparisons, and that is the key, in my opinion, that's the key to getting a whip identical with its twin. But before I get too carried away, do you see that happen? That was crazy. Perfect. So now I can go ahead and carry out the rest of this foundation. Now I like to put a couple of nails on the left and right side of these artificial sinew foundations just to uh, ensure that it's not going to slide anywhere. In. Yeah. There's one. And the second one on the other side. go. Whip number one, whip number two, and on the left side. Perfect. 
Now it's time to tie a two pass five by four Turks head knot on both of these whip transitions and they'll be ready for a bath of hot wax. First pass is complete so we're going to slide it on up over our transition and we can just tighten these down a little bit. Two pass five by four Turks head knot on whip number one is complete. Now we just have to snip off the excess, give that a roll, and we'll move on to number two to finish things off. All knots have been tied. Transition knots, heel knots, the whips have been rolled. Falls attached. We are ready to wax both of these whips. All right, I just pulled both of these whips out of the wax and they are ready for cracker attachment going to be using the inner strand, one of the five inner strands, 550 parachute cord for our crackers. So just how we always do it, one end of this going in my teeth and the other looping through the permalock needle. So one cracker is complete and we will begin to tie cracker number two. Now up until the very end of this whip, we've been making comparisons of whip number one with whip number two. and We're gonna be doing the same thing with the crackers. And not only the twisted portion, but also the tassel portion. Cracker number two is in progress, but before we tie it, we want to stretch both of them out here. I have not tied the knot in cracker two yet. I'm just looking to see where that knot is. So I'm going to loosely tie the knot, but I'm not going to tighten it yet because if we do that, we're tying it blind and we can't see, we can't make that comparison. So I'm going to line the tips up like this, just gently pull that. As long as the knot is loose, we have the ability to move it around wherever we need it to go. So just making the comparison. And I know this seems a little bit trivial, but it is important in getting the whips to be balanced and having the timing correct in both of them. And that looks good. I'm gonna pull that tight. Second, we have the tassels. If you notice, the tassels are a little bit shorter on these crackers than normal, and I like to do that because it's going to make the whips crack more easily. I'm going to hold these tassels together. I can make that comparison grabbing my scissors. And there we go. Both crackers are of equal length in both the braided portion as well as the tassels at the end. Now it's time to attach these to our whips. I've got my awl here creating a hole. While that's stretching that out, taking our crackers and twisting it with the, with the twist, with that helix going with it to encourage a sharper point so we can get it through the fall. So quickly, comes out, goes through, opening up our eye, just like we've always done. goes through and pulling the fall through. This is like a lanyard knot. Comes through like that. And whip number one is complete. Let's do the same thing to whip number two. Whip number two is complete and this project is finished. Thank you guys so much for stopping by and watching this tutorial. I hope you learned something new and are now challenged to make a matched set of whips. Thank you Andreas for your business. I will see you guys in the next one.
So as you can see, this is the curl. The <laughs> 911, what's your emergency? We got some kids shooting 22s in the park.